Hello and welcome to Chapter 4, Lecture uh, uh, on Gapinski's Healthcare Finance. So we'll be covering the material that is in Chapter 4 of Gapinski. Uh, I'll be doing this in a three-part lecture. And in Chapter 4, we focus on the second half of the four key uh, statements that make up a organization's financial statement. So that is the balance sheet and the statement of cash flows. Um, and so... In chapter three, we covered uh, the income statement and statement of changes in owner's equity. Uh, and now we'll, which covered kind of the, the change over time. Uh, the balance sheet is more like a snapshot um, of what the organization has uh, for resources and the obligations that the organization has uh, both to its owners as well as to its creditors. So uh, as I kind of just said, the balance sheet presents a picture of the business's assets and liabilities. And then the statement of cash flows um, kind of reconciles the balance sheet and the um, income statement. And at the same time, uh, also brings us into uh, kind of aligns us with a with the actual cash flows of the organization if you remember from chapter 3 what we we talked about how we do in 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 any organization that's required to comply with generally accepted accounting principles or gap uh we're going to do accrual accounting which means that there's a a um loose uh uh joint between um the revenues and expenses that we we uh, account for uh, on the income statement and the actual cash that's flowing in and out of the organization. So the statement of cash flows gives us a perspective on how much cash the organization actually has and how it's actually using its cash. And in order to get to that statement of cash flows, we're going to work with the balance sheet and the income statement uh, to, to kind of track how the cash is flowing. All right, so uh, we'll start with the balance sheet. Um, so where is the balance sheet, excuse me, where the income statement contains information about the uh, business's operations and profitability, the balance sheet is more about, um, is more like a snapshot in time um, about what the organization has to execute its mission and then um, who has claims on the assets that the organization is using to execute its mission. So it's, it's a, as I said a couple of times now, it's a snapshot. So it's kind of like, think of the, um, the balance sheet is like your end of year uh, bank statement that you get from the bank. And it simply says, this is how much money you have in the bank. Um, and it might also say, this is how much money you had at the, at the beginning of the year. This is how much you have now. Um, uh, uh, but, but at a minimum, your bank statement is going to tell you, hey, on December 31st, you have this much money in the bank. And that's kind of what a, a, a balance sheet is. And if you can kind of, to kind of continue the metaphor, a, um, an income statement is more like getting your W-2, which tells you this is how much money you earned over the course of a year. A bank statement, at a minimum, it may tell you kind of, hey, here's a snapshot of what you had on January 1st, and here's a snapshot of what you have today. Um, but, a, um, but your W-2 tells you this is how much money you earned over time. Um, so that's kind of the very basic difference between a balance sheet and a income statement or a way to think about it. Um, uh, in a more technical terminology, an income statement uh, captures a flow, right? A flow of resources over time. Um, and a balance sheet captures uh, a stock, um, uh, which means like this is how much it, at any given point in time you have. So. Um, so the balance sheet, uh, we use the phrase balance sheet and balance um, because as you can see from the slide here, the balance sheet has two sides to it. On the left side, we have the assets of the organization. And on the right side, we have the liabilities and owner's equity. And if you think of this in like a classic kind of like scales of justice kind of thing where, um, you know, the, 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 the statue holds up a scale and, um, and there's a fulcrum and, and, and the, there's two, you know, little pans. And if, if the weight on both sides of the pan pans are the same, then, um, 
than the pan sit level. Uh, and if they're out of balance, then one is higher than the other. So with the balance sheet, um, both sides, if, if the balance sheet is done properly, both sides of the balance sheet, the asset side and the liabilities and owner's equity side, uh, total up to the same value. Um, and so in order for the balance sheet to be balanced, the total assets have to equal the total of the liabilities and owner's equity or net assets if, if we're talking about a not-for-profit. So one of the metaphors um, that I like to use uh, is to call it, uh, to, to think of this as a house. Um, and uh, we'll talk about this, uh, you know, the, the slides will use this metaphor in a minute again. But so you know, when I moved up to New Hampshire, my wife and I were living down in Texas and uh, we started thinking about, well, where would we want to live? What can we afford? Um, you know, and uh, let's see what the housing prices are like up, up in New Hampshire. Um, so we logged on to a website called Zillow, um, which uh, shows you, you know, na different neighborhoods and it tells you the um, approximate uh, market price of um, houses, right? And it also tells you some information about the houses, like how many bedrooms does it have and so forth. Um, so, but what it, what it doesn't tell you, what Zillow does not tell you is how much, uh, how big of a mortgage the current owner has on their house. So let's imagine that I'm Googling or, or I'm on Zillow and I'm looking for a, uh, looking at a house and it says, oh, that house is $500,000 not I, uh, professors don't generally don't live in $500,000 houses. I'll just share that, but I will use a simple number. Um, uh, but let's say I found a house and it said that this house has a, a, a value of $500,000. What that's really telling me is this is the asset price of the house. So in a sense, what I can see on Zillow is the left side of the balance sheet. I can see the value of the of the house, the physical thing, but what I what I don't see on Zillow is okay. It's a five hundred thousand dollar house. How much of a mortgage do the current occupants have? Do they have a four hundred thousand dollar mortgage and a hundred thousand dollars in equity? Do they have a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage and three hundred thousand dollars in equity? I don't know, but but if those two examples I just gave you, two hundred thousand in 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 mortgage and three hundred thousand in equity, that has to add up to the five hundred thousand dollar price, the five hundred thousand dollar value of the house, right? Um, if they have four hundred thousand dollars in mortgage and one hundred thousand dollars in equity, that adds up to uh, five hundred thousand um, again. So. Um, so and if you own a house, you know this too, right? If you own a um, $500,000 house and you have uh, a $250,000 mortgage, th which is a liability, then you have $250,000 in equity. So if, if, as we work with the balance sheet, if you can kind of keep that simple metaphor in mind that um, the asset side has to add up to the liabilities and owner's equity. And really the liabilities, and whereas the assets refer to the stuff of an organization, the liabilities and owner's equity side really just refers to who owns the stuff, right? And if you can think about, um, if I have a $500,000 house and I have a $250,000 mortgage, then I own half the house and the bank owns half the house, right? Um, and cause if I stop paying, what the bank is going to do is foreclose on the house. They're going to take it to, um, take it to, they're going to sell the house. They're going to pay themselves back the $250,000 and whatever is left, they'll give back to me. Um, so I think that's a useful metaphor, uh, for thinking about the balance sheet. Um, I like to say, at, you know, how do you know if something is an asset? Well, can you, can you touch it? Can you sell it? Can you spend it? Um, if you can answer one of those three things, can you touch it? Is it a physical thing? Then it's an asset. If you can spend it like cash, then it's an asset. If you can sell it um, and get cash, then that's an asset, right? Um, uh, you can't, and to think about this, like if you were to say, well, I have $250,000 in equity in my house, you can't sell your equity, right? Um, 
so uh, you can refinance the house and, and um, you know, uh, take out a larger loan, increase your liabilities. And in a way that's kind of selling your equity, but you're, no, nobody's going to actually buy your equity. Um, so that's a, a, a kind of a simple, a, a simplified way of trying to think about it. Okay. So um, the basic format for a balance sheet, like I said, uh, is, is actually an accounting identity. Assets have to equal liabilities and owner's equity. So liabilities plus equity has to equal assets. And you can rearrange these, um, you know, this simple uh, identity uh, to say, well, equity has to equal assets minus liabilities. So that's kind of like saying, um, well, if I have a $500,000 house and I have a $200,000 mortgage, then my equity must be $300,000. Um, so simple algebra there, we can, you know, we can rearrange um, uh, the elements of the uh, uh, equation, um, but it is an identity. Assets always have to equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Okay. And um, uh, so here's a demonstration of what I was just talking about. We have a ho home worth $300,000. That represents our assets. Um, and uh, liabilities and owner's equity, $200,000 mortgage, $100,000 equity. We have to be able to add those two things. Those two things have to add up to um, the value of the total assets. So the total assets have to equal the total liabilities and owner's equity. So we have 300 and 300. Now we're in balance. Think of the scales being level. All right. Um, an important point that we talked about a, a bit last time and and now it will become it will keep coming up is um, uh, when you talk about a house like Zillow right like so I'm going on Zillow and looking at market values it's a market value not a historical value uh, and last time when we talked about gap we said um, uh, assets are are most assets are carried at their historical purchase price, not at their market value. So uh, real assets like a house, so if this was, so here's where the metaphor kind of diverges with accounting practices. Um, uh, if you were looking on Zillow uh, five years ago and then, uh, and then today, most houses would have increased, their market value would have increased. Um, so if you had, you bought this house for $300,000 five years ago, you took out a $200,000 mortgage. Um, and let's say you, it, you know, it was, uh, you hadn't paid anything towards the mortgage. You still had a $200,000 mortgage today, five years later, but now the house's market value has increased from 300,000 to 400,000. Well, now your total assets would be 400,000. Um, your mortgage would still be 200,000, but your equity would now be 200,000. So that does not apply uh, when we're talking about uh, a, a balance sheet. So if we were talking about this as like a hospital or a clinic uh, that happened to own a building, um, if the market value of the building had increased, we would carry, we would still carry the, 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 the building on the uh, balance sheet at its purchase price, not at its market value. So that's where this metaphor kind of breaks down. But it's still a useful way of thinking about, you know, and kind of getting that basic idea that assets represents um, uh, the, the stuff that an organization has. So in this, in this metaphor, the house itself, and then the liabilities and owner's equity represents the obligations uh, and ownership of uh, the business. And those two sides have to add up. Okay, so we've been playing with uh, the metaphor of a house, but now let's actually, well, let's look at uh, our made up organization, Sunnyvale Clinic. Uh, we're going to start by looking at the left side of the balance sheet or the assets. So we are looking at, you know, the, like I said, the left side here, right, total assets. So we're gonna look at this side of the balance sheet. For now, we're gonna set aside the liabilities and owner's equity. We'll do that in the second part uh, of the lecture. So um, total assets are broken down into two broad categories. There are current assets and there are long-term assets. 
and the divide um, between current and long term is will the asset is the asset expected to be used or converted into cash within one year um, so if you own a building right you're not going to use it up in the course of a year so that's a long-term asset but if you have a box of band-aids um, most likely so that would count as inventory right we've got an inventory here so inventory for a clinic like sunnyvale would have you know boxes of band-aids and syringes and um, uh, gauze pads and um, uh, otoscope covers and all other kind of you know kinds of things uh, that that you know are are used and then thrown away right so um, so that would be an example of um, an expendable uh, uh, item um, it's used and expensed so so inventory is typically just used up in the course of business and so it's going to be used up in less than a year right? You're going to use a Band-Aid one time and you're done. Um, and so that those, so inventories are typically carried as current assets. Um, whereas uh, uh, buildings and vehicles and furniture and other equipment like operating room tables and patient beds and Da Vinci robots would all be carried as property and specifically long-lived property. So we had this discussion last time uh, in chapter three about uh, depreciation and, and how that works. And we'll do a little more with that. Um, but so we have, for, so the first section of the asset uh, uh, side of the balance sheet are the current assets. So these are the things that we think we'll use up within one year or will be converted into cash within one year. So obviously cash is already cash. It's already been, you know, it's already uh, cash. So that is a, current, is, is a current asset. And it is the most liquid of the, of the current assets. So typically we list our current assets in order of liquidity. So cash it, and cash equivalents is the first line. Um, a cash a cash equivalents uh, would typically be um, so we have literal cash and then we have things like checking accounts uh, which are essentially cash because we can immediately take them out um, and then we have uh, so the next line here we most commonly see is uh, short term um, uh, investments and um, and then uh, so those would be things like uh, money that we don't, we, we want to have things, we want to have resources that are readily available to us and can easily be converted into cash, but maybe aren't currently uh, being kept as cash because cash doesn't earn any interest. Um, and so uh, we might put those into a money market account um, or a CD or a, um, uh, a treasury bill, you know, a federal, uh, a treasury bill issued by the federal government. Um, next we have, well, let me skip here. So we, uh, we're going to hit uh, and do some more. We have some better slides that can kind of talk through these. So, um, so again, the broad definition, like I was saying before, assets are um, the uh, things that a, an organization uses uh, to, uh, uh, to execute its business, to, to create economic benefit. And um, so current assets, I've talked to you about cash, cash equivalents, um, which would be um, uh, things like checking account uh, and then other assets that are expected to be converted into cash or could be, not necessarily will be, but could be converted into cash uh, within the next year. Um, so specific examples, um, uh, so going with uh, short term, so we talk cash, talk cash equivalents, talk sh uh, some short term uh, investments. Also, can you can also see them listed as marketable securities. So these are by definition very low risk. Um, so a, a classic example is a treasury bill um, issued by the U.S. Treasury, um, uh, and um, uh, they they yield very low uh, returns. Um, but they are uh, extremely safe. Um, so why do businesses hold short-term investments? Because cash doesn't yield any interest. And, if, and you want to have a certain amount of cash on hand all the time in order to pay your bills right away. But 
um, if you, if you, um, but if you don't, but most businesses carry more cash than they actually need at any given time um, as a cash cushion. Um, so they want to earn interest if they can on the, um, uh, on the excess cash that they're carrying. And in very large companies, this is the role of the treasurer uh, or one of the roles of the treasurer is to make sure that the business is, is earning some, is, is maintaining the right amount of cash in order to pay their, pay their bills. But at the same time, any excess is earning, uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, any excess um, that they carry can be put into some sort of interest bearing account that will likely earn them, uh, will earn them some interest. Uh, and if you're talking about, you know, um, millions or billions of dollars, that's, uh, that's important. Okay. Um, so current assets, like I said, are expected to be able to be quickly converted into cash or used up, uh, in the process of the business. So, so, you know, um, uh, inventory is going to be used up. Cash, of course, is already cash. Uh, uh, inventory could be converted into cash. And the way you would do that is you would, you would return it to the vendor or you would sell it um, to, to convert it to cash. So current assets are, are important to an organization um, because they uh, allow the organization to pay its obligations, um, its short-term obligations. So um, uh, uh, your employees expect to be paid. And in order to pay your employees, you have to have cash. Your suppliers um, may give you, uh, may sell you things on credit, but they expect you to, you know, they expect you to pay them within a relatively short time frame with cash. So you always need to have a certain amount of cash on hand. So we are concerned about the liquidity of the organization. Right. So you can be, you may have heard the phrase, um, a, a lot of elderly are house rich and cash poor, meaning they've paid off their house a long time ago and they're living in their house, um, but they're living off their social security. So um, they don't have a lot of, of income coming in, um, but they're sitting on this big asset uh, that is worth a lot of money. So they're not very liquid, if you would you know, uh, in, and so, you know, some folks get pulled into reverse mortgages and things like that, which I'm not a fan of. Um, but, uh, uh, but um, uh, the point here is a lot of elderly who have paid off their house have uh, long term assets in the form of their of their property. Um, but they don't have very much cash on hand. And so they're not very liquid. A business needs to be adequately liquid. Um, and so, uh, so we're concerned about that. And we use a couple of measures at the end. We'll talk about, uh, the current ratio, um, but, uh, which is a ratio of current assets to current liabilities. But another way of looking at that is to measure the networking capital of an organization. Uh, and the networking capital of an organization is its current assets minus its current liabilities. And um, what we're trying to get at with our networking capital is to see, um, first of all, we want it to be a positive number um, because if our current liabilities exceed our current assets, uh, that means we're not going to be able to, we are, we are potentially not going to be able to pay our bills, right? So we want to have a positive networking capital um, uh, and you, you, know, you, want it, you want the current assets to exceed current liabilities. And in a lot of these kind of situations, you know, uh, so, so the, the question at the bottom here is how good is this measure? Um, well, it's an important measure, right? In the sense that you want it to be positive, um, but it's hard to kind of evaluate it on its own um, because uh, is 38,000 a good number, bad number? It's hard to say. Um, should you have, uh, uh, and so networking capital, sorry, excuse me, the current ratio gives you a ratio instead of, uh, of, a, of, an, of an absolute figure. Um, and that is often a little more useful for trying to figure out whether um, you're doing well or not. And we'll talk about networking capital at the end of the third lecture. Okay. So um, net accounts payable, uh, excuse me, accounts receivable. We'll also talk about accounts payable. Net accounts receivable um, 
represents revenues owed to the business but not yet collected. So in chapter three lecture, I talked about, um, you know, most healthcare is done um, through a third party payer. And so let's say a patient comes into a clinic and is seen uh, and the allowed charge by the insurance company is $100 and the patient has a $20 copay. So on the day that the patient is seen, the patient pay, you know, hands over $20 or hands over their credit card and charges $20. Um, but then there's this $80 that this $80 bill that's being sent off uh, to the, um, to the uh, uh, insurance company. And the insurance company is going to pay that sometime in the future, hopefully in the near future. So the, the $80 becomes an account receivable. And, you know, a, a well-functioning clinic is going to have lots of those every day, right? So every day, all the docs and all the nurse practitioners and PAs uh, and the, you know, and let's say it's a physical therapy or, you know, whatever people are, you know, seeing patients and we're generating these fees uh, and we're sending out bills to the insurance companies and all of those accumulate, uh, all of those, all of those bills that we send out accumulate as accounts receivable. Um, and so, uh, uh, in the example we're working with here, uh, Sunnyvale had $169,000 in reported patient service revenue in 2015. Um, and a total, uh, sorry, 169 million uh, in, in um, patient uh, service revenue in 2015 and 28 million of it uh, had yet to be collected. So um, where's the 141 million that has been collected? Um, Well, most of that money flowed right back out again to pay for the expenses uh, of operating the uh, uh, clinic over the course of a year, but it'll also show up in changes in cash um, and and other uh, uh, and other resources. So we'll see where the cash flowed when we get to the cash flow statement. Okay, um, so. The other category here is inventories. So we're still in current assets. Another category of a common category that you're going to see on uh, almost every um, uh, uh, income, uh, excuse me, balance sheet is going to be inventory. Um, so uh, for healthcare providers, that inventory is going to be stuff like, you know, bandages and uh, syringes and um, uh, reagents for your lab and you know whatever else you're using to actually provide um, medical care um, and you know so i was saying supplies are typically consumed in the process of treating patients so they're expensed so you'll hear that term expensed uh, on the income statements so they show up as an expense when they're used they show up as an expense on the income statement but we carry them as inventory until they're used and then at that point the inventory is reduced um, and an expense appears on the uh, income statement. And going back to that, you know, to the double entry. So when the, when the um, say, you know, you use um, a dose of flu vaccine, um, inventory is uh, uh, credited and, uh, and um, supply expense is debited. Uh, so you have, you know, uh, Two, two journal entries, one on the uh, left and one on the right. Um, okay, uh, but it's expensed as opposed to depreciated. Um, the, the, remember a, a, a building, which we talked about in chapter three, has a 39 year useful life. So if you have a, a uh, you are not going to expense a building um, because expensing something means you, 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 charge yourself for the full value of the, uh, the asset in the course of, of the year. Uh, so instead, you're going to depreciate long-lived assets. You're going to expense uh, 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 the, the resources like um, paper and pens um, and then your medical supplies. Okay, so um, 
uh, providers that have a small inventory, you might, you know, if you, if you're not, you know, if you're, if your service does not use a lot of inventory, then you might just kind of dump it into a, an other current assets account um, with all the other cats and dogs that are not of, of great significance. So this is another thing we talked about at the beginning of chapter three, right, is kind of a, uh, uh, cost benefit analysis of how much detail do we get into well if you you know if you're a hospital and the second largest uh uh expense for your operation is supplies you're not going to dump your supplies into some ge general um you know other current assets account you're going to have that that number broken out uh but if you are you know uh some sort of provider that uh doesn't doesn't use a lot of inventory. So maybe you're an insurance company, um, you know, and use paper. Uh, you're not, that's probably just going to be in other current assets. Okay. Um, so I mentioned earlier that current assets are typically listed in order of, of uh, liquidity um, with nearness to cash. So cash is cash. So that obviously is the most liquid. And then the order kind of follows here. Um, you know, uh, patient accounts receivable are expected to be converted into cash uh, within a year. Um, otherwise, they're a different kind of asset. Um, uh, uh, but you can also um, do a thing called factoring, which is where you basically sell uh, your accounts receivable to a, to a, an, another party who then goes and collects uh, you know, collects on the accounts receivable uh, and earns back uh, uh, the money that, that uh, they paid you. Um, and then inventories, right? So current assets, you, you, these are the things you need uh, to conduct your, um, uh, conduct your business, uh, but they're not really going to earn, um, uh, 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 return themselves. So uh, should businesses hold large amounts of current assets? Well, should you hold a large amount, you know, let's say you're a, um, you know, you're a clinic and you uh, typically use $10,000 worth of um, uh, medical supplies each month. Should you go ahead and buy $120,000 worth of medical supplies at the beginning of the year and then just use it up as you go. Well, that used to be the case. So like when I first started working uh, in a hospital in the early 90s, uh, we had big warehouses where we kept lots of, um, uh, of, of inventory on hand. Uh, and then the wards carried lots of inventory and the clinics carried lots of inventory. And we have, and over over the last, 30-ish years, um, we have gone through a process of reducing inventories at uh, in organizations. And that's not just true in healthcare, that's true kind of across the board. We have, in all industries, everybody has realized that carrying inventory has a cost. And so think about what I said a minute ago. When I first came to um, work in a hospital, we used to have a big warehouse. Well, that hospital, that very hospital that I worked at, um, William Beaumont Army Medical Center down in El Paso, Texas, no longer has a warehouse, right? They now, uh, they no longer have a warehouse, so they don't have to pay for that space, right? They don't have to pay for that building. They don't have to pay to maintain it. They don't have to pay staff to move, you know, move these large amounts of supplies around. Um, so there's a, there's a very explicit cost involved in carrying large amounts of inventory. But further on top of that, if you have $120,000 in inventory instead of $10,000 in inventory, you now have, you now have an extra $110,000 tied up, $110,000 in cash tied up in inventory that could instead be earning interest in a uh, treasury bill you know, earning some small amount of interest, but it's better than no interest or even better than paying rent uh, to have a, to have space to have your 
full year's inventory sitting in your clinic, right? So there's some, ex there's an explicit cost of, you know, providing the space and the security and, you know, uh, uh, the maintenance of the inventory. And then there's the kind of, um, secondary effect of if you tie up your resources in the inventory, then you can't use those resources for something else at, at a minimum that that would be, um, earning interest on, on, on the cash value. Okay. So we've covered kind of the, the most common categories of current assets that you're going to see in a, in a healthcare delivery organization. Now we turn to the other category of assets, which are long-term assets and first are uh, long-term investments. Okay. So it's easy to use the phrase investments to mean a lot of different things. When we use the phrase long-term investments on the balance sheet, we have a specific meaning in mind, and that is a long-term investment is a um, financial asset or a financial security, and it, as opposed to real assets, um, which are physical things like buildings and um, uh, and vehicles and equipment that you have in the organization. So a financial asset refers to things like, you know, we've been mentioning um, uh, 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 stocks, bonds, things that are a little less liquid uh, than, um, uh, than say a T-bill, um, but also carry uh, by implication a little more risk. Um, so if your if your hospital has excess funds that it is it is setting aside um, with the uh, purpose of, of of being able to finance um, uh, say replacement of your of your building uh, in twenty years, uh, you're probably going to invest in something that carries a little more risk with the hope that you're going to get a little more return. Um, financial assets like stocks and bonds uh, tend to uh, fluctuate with the market. Um, and, uh, you know, for the last seven or eight years, we've had a bull market, meaning the asset value, financial assets have been increasing in value kind of across the board. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, and that is one way that some of the smaller hospitals you know, for example, in New Hampshire, um, that have operating losses have had non-operating gains. They've been able to kind of offset the losses from you know delivery of healthcare uh, with gains from uh, from their financial assets. Um, so, long-term investments uh, is going to refer to specifically to financial assets as opposed to buildings and equipment, which we'll refer to as real assets or as property plant and equipment. Um, now, uh, okay. So, um, this account is sometimes referred to as funded depreciation. Uh, and that is, um, that phrase would be used more often by a not-for-profit business, uh, than an investor owned business. And so why would that be? Well, not-for-profit entities tend to accumulate um, reserves over time with the goal of, um, and they, they accumulate investments with the goal of being able to fund um, the construction of new buildings. So when we say funded depreciation, what we're really talking about is the fact that, you know, your building wears out over time. So after 30 or 40 years, you're probably going to need to replace that building. Uh, and so this, uh, um, uh, these resources that are gathered in the long-term investments, um, uh, keep, uh, 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 keep increasing, keep uh, uh, creating a pool uh, to draw from when it comes time to actually uh, reinvest in the organization. Not for profit, excuse me, for profits uh, often extract more of their, um, uh, of their um, earnings uh, to give back to their investors. And when it comes time to build a new building, they finance uh, the uh, new building with external funding. Now, not-for-profits do the same thing as well to, to a degree, but it's necessary uh, to keep that 
to keep that um, pool of funds on hand to show uh, potential creditors uh, that there is in fact value uh, in the in the organization. All right, so so we had long term investments; those are our financial assets. Now we're going to talk about property and equipment, um, uh, which refers to, um, uh, I say property, plant, and equipment, but property and equipment um, is kind of the same. Property, so plant refers to kind of the buildings. Um, uh, either one works. I, call, I tend to say PPE because uh, I, I just happen to, you know, have learned it that way. Uh, your, the book uses property and equipment a little more, but net property and equipment represents um, uh, you're, you're going to capture in this account um, all of the assets that um, uh, consist of land, the buildings, and the equipment, right? So you know, land doesn't depreciate, but buildings and equipment do, right? Land doesn't go bad over time, doesn't break down over time. Uh, you know, in, in the broad sense of the word. Um, and then buildings and equipment, which do in fact depreciate. And so you can think of your building and then you can think of everything inside the building that isn't expensed over the course of a year, like paper and pencils, but, you know, your desks, um, your computers, you know, uh, all the stuff that fills uh, a building uh, is is fits into the equipment category. So you're going to have in your property and equipment um, or property plant and equipment account, you're going to have the value of the land, the value, the historical purchase price of the land, the historical uh, cost of building your building, and then the historical purchase price of all your equipment. That all gets dumped into the property and equipment um, uh, uh, account. And then when we, we refer to net property and equipment, we're going to, over time, we talked about in chapter three, your property and equipment, so uh, not your, other than your land, your property and equipment uh, is going to have depreciation. It's going to lose value over time. So we calculate, we, we, we carry the um, gross amount of the uh, purchase price of the value, right? And so if we look down here, um, we have the original purchase price of our land was 2.9 million. The buildings and equipment were 85 million. So the gross property and equipment is 88 million, right? Um, and the buildings and equipment over time depreciate. So if I had a $39 million building, just to be simple, and I have a 39 million, uh, 39 year useful life, I would have annual straight line depreciation of $1 million a year. So after the first year, my building, um, pro the line for my building would be 39 million. And then my accumulated depreciation after the first year for my building would be 1 million. And so my net, net um, amount of, for the buildings would be 39 minus one or 38. And so that's how this basically works is we have our gross property and equipment, which is the original historical price. And then each year we add on the depreciation um, from the current year to the accumulated depreciation. So in year two of my $39 million building, I would have the gross value of 39. Then I would have had last year's 1 million and this year's 1 million. So the accumulated depreciation at the end of year two would be 2 million. And the net property and equipment, or the net property in this case would be 39 minus two or 37. In year three, we'd have $3 million in accumulated depreciation because we would have had 1 million from the first year, 1 million from the second year, 1 million from the third year. So that's 3 million in accumulated depreciation. Our gross or original value would be 39 minus three would be 36. So that's what accumulated depreciation looks like. So this organization has accumulated has originally purchased $88 million in, uh, in, in property and equipment. And they have over time accumulated $36 million against that original purchase price. So the balance of their net property and equipment is 52 million. Now that said, this is historical prices. So maybe the building has actually increased in value 
uh, since they purchased it, whenever that was. Um, it's possible um, uh, that they have. Uh, so this is, a, this is what we refer to as the book value uh, of an organization as opposed to its market value, well, not of an organization, but of its, of its property plan and equipment, as opposed to its market value. The market value would be how much could we sell all our stuff for? Um, and that, that amount might be greater than the net number that we're reporting. Oftentimes it is. And so uh, when we look at, you know, if, if you were trying to value um, a business, so for example, you're, you're thinking about buying a practice, um, kind of the base uh, valuation would be, well, what is, um, you know, what's the book value that they're reporting on their balance sheet? And you know, that would be, you, you would say, well, for sure, um, I'm going to have to pay something more than that because the business is probably worth, you know, the market value of the assets are probably worth more than that. Um, and then the business as a going concern is probably worth more than that. And we'll get into that in later chapters talking about, you know, how to value a business. But one very basic measure would be, well, what's the book value of their stuff, right? No, well, that's how much we, that's kind of the minimum that we would have to pay. All right. Um, so I'm going to, let's see, uh, sorry, I'm trying to decide if I'm pause you here. So I'm just going to rearrange, was just rearranging, uh, one slide here. So, um, okay. So we've walked through the asset side of, uh, the balance sheet. Remember, this is the left side of the balance sheet. It is the stuff of an organization. It is the stuff that the organization uses in the process of running its business to create economic value. Um, so we've gone through uh, the categories. I, uh, this, what you're looking at right now, and hopefully you can, you can see it reasonably well on your screen. Um, I, I went on the internet and found an annual, an old annual report. As you can see, it's from 2000. You know, probably done in early 2014, um, but you know, nothing has changed about the structure of a balance sheet. So this is um, uh, the balance sheet, the asset side of a balance sheet for a community hospital. And so this is an actual balance sheet. Um, and so I want you to see that, you know, what we reviewed is actually how uh, an organization reports it. So this is kind of a, um, a high level balance sheet because it is in their annual report as opposed to their um, uh, uh, audited financial statements. But it's, it's, uh, it, the only difference is it's a little more aggregated uh, for easy consumption. But let's run through the you know, quick review. So we're on the asset side and we said the, the, um, the asset side divides down into current assets and long-term assets. So we, you can see here the first section is current assets and the first line is cash and cash equivalents, you know, which we talked about, then short-term investments, then accounts receivable, less allowance for doubtful accounts. So I don't think we talked about that specifically, but the um, accounts receivable uh, or net accounts receivable um, is uh, you're going to have the amounts that we assume uh, or, or the amounts that we've billed out and haven't collected yet. That's our accounts receivable. And then we plug in an allowance um, for doubtful accounts. Doubtful accounts are the accounts that we, the estimate we have for how much bad debt we think we're going to have. So how much of, uh, uh, how much, uh, how many of these accounts do we think we weren't going to collect on ultimately? Um, though we have, so we're carrying, we, we're carrying these IOUs, these bills that we sent out, and we think um, that we are not going to be able to collect on. So this organization had uh, almost $27 million in um, uh, net accounts receivable. And over here, we can see that they had 14 million in doubtful accounts. So their, their accounts receivable is actually 27 plus 14, roughly. Um, so 27 and 14 is 31, 41 million. Um, 14, so so four, they would have 41 million in accounts receivable, 14 of which they don't think they're going to collect. Um, 
And then uh, their inventories on hand, 2.7 million. Uh, they had some, we didn't talk about prepaid expenses, um, but these are things that they've paid ahead. Um, and so since they've already paid ahead, uh, uh, it counts as an asset. Um, so, uh, and then other current assets, we talked about kind of there's a cats and dogs account for stuff that's, you know, not of, of, of great enough significance to, to warrant its own line. Um, and then um, there are funds, uh, current portion of funds held by the trustee under revenue bond agreements. It's kind of complicated, but it's you know uh, uh, cash and cash equivalents that are being set aside um, in order to fund bonds uh, that this organization has um, uh, issued. So that's our, and then we get our total current assets. So our total current assets for this organization is 78 million. Um, whoop. And then they have investments. So these are long-term investments. Um, and then there are, in addition to, uh, uh, these are limited to use. So this is a not-for-profit entity. Um, and, those in, and, and so those investments have been limited uh, by the, um, either by the uh, board of trustees or because they were um, donations given with restrictions on them. Um, and then there are other long-term assets uh, that are being held uh, for other, um, other purposes, uh, including the possibility of uh, professional liability claims. So, and then we get to property, plant, and equipment. So here they use PPE, property, plant, and equipment, as opposed to just property and equipment. Um, and it's net. So they're not showing um, gross property and equipment and then the accumulated depreciation. This is simply the purchase price of all the property, plant, and equipment minus its accumulated depreciation. So they're not breaking it out here. So this is an example of aggregation uh, on the balance sheet, right? And so they have $97 million worth of stuff, uh, long-term stuff, right? And so, and then they have other long-term assets worth $12 million and we don't know what that is. And they've just kind of aggregated together because it's not important enough to separate it out and give it its own, um, uh, give it its own lines. So when we add up the uh, total current assets, um, the investments, the funds held by the trustee, the property, plant and equipment, and the other assets, that adds up to $363 million. And we're going to do the liabilities section in the, in the next lecture. And I'll have the liabilities and owner's equity side um, at the end of that discussion. And we'll see that it also adds up to $363 million. All right.